Hello, friends. This is the third lecture of a series where we go through the book on quantum mechanics by Steven Weinberg. This is part three of chapter three on the general principles of quantum mechanics. As we have explained, we will first go through chapter three, then two, which is applying the principles in this chapter to a particle moving in a central potential, followed by chapter one. Which talks about the historical development of quantum mechanics, and so on. We feel that this is a more logical reading sequence. In the last lecture, we have introduced the continuum states, discussed the position and momentum operators, and ended up deriving the famous Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. Today, we shall talk about symmetries in quantum mechanics, which is an important topic in theoretical physics. The highlight of this lecture is probably the proof of the Campbell-Baker-Hausdorff formula, which is perhaps the key equation in group theory. That is the mathematics behind symmetries. We shall arrive at the complete proof of this theorem by the end of this lecture. This is a result not commonly found in most textbooks on quantum mechanics. But since Weinberg himself wished to approach this subject from the perspective of symmetries, we thought it would be good to include this. So look forward to it. As preparation, let's introduce a new operator known as a unitary operator. A unitary operator is a linear operator which preserves the inner product between two state vectors. That is, let u x on some state psi and on another state phi. The inner product between these two resulting states must be equal to the original inner product between phi and psi if u is unitary. The first equality comes from the fact that an operator incurs a dagger if we pull it out from a bra. This is the definition of a Hermitian conjugation. The second equality implies that u dagger u must be equal to the identity operator. If psi and phi are arbitrary states, this means that the Hermitian conjugation of an unitary operator is also its inverse. This equation is usually the definition of the unitary operator. Let's put these two alternative definitions at the top for easy reference as we go through some applications. First, we demonstrate that one can always change a vector basis to another. By the action of an appropriate unitary operator. It is assumed that both the old and new bases are orthonormal. Using this orthonormality, it is apparent that one can construct an unitary operator with this Kapra representation. Such that when u acts on an element of the old basis, one gets the corresponding element in the new basis. What is left to do now is to show that this Kapra representation is indeed unitary. That is, we must show that it satisfies this condition above. For this, we also need u dagger. Using the auto normality of the new basis, followed by the completeness of the old basis, we arrived at the desired result. Hence, we have shown that the cat bra representation, which converts the psi basis to the psi tilde basis. Is in fact a unitary operator. It is apparent by using the same argument that u times u dagger is also the identity. Therefore, u dagger is really the inverse of u. This fact that any change of basis can be affected by a unitary operator is important in many proofs where we need to demonstrate that a relation is basis independent. We shall see examples of this in the future. Now we show how unitary operators can be used to represent symmetry transformations in quantum mechanics.
First, let's define what we mean by a symmetry transformation. It is an operation that may change physical states, but preserves the laws of physics if they possess this symmetry. The first part of this statement describes a general feature that must be satisfied by any symmetry, while the second part is a condition which indicates the specific symmetries that some laws of physics or physical interactions may possess. Let's first look into the general features of symmetries. Let me explain what we mean by the laws of physics. Here, in the general sense, it refers to the formalism of quantum mechanics, where we have all the possible state vectors that correspond to all physical states and the complete relations between them described by transition probabilities, which is what we can actually measure. A symmetry transformation maps the unprimed states to the prime states, and we have the resulting transformed quantum mechanical framework. Since the states are mapped in a one-to-one -one manner, the quantum mechanical framework will be physically identical to its former self if the relations between all states remain the same. In other words, all transition probabilities must be unchanged by the symmetry transformation. This is the general constraint that must be satisfied by any symmetry. Another way to say this is that if every state is transformed, then nothing is transformed, because there would be no frame of reference to measure these changes. Take the example of spatial translations. If everything is translated the same way, including the observer, then there would be no point of reference to measure this translation. Let's look at how this constraint of the invariance of probabilities can be satisfied. Solution 1. The probabilities are unchanged because the amplitudes themselves remain the same. We implement the transformation with some linear operator u, which is not assumed to be unitary. As with any linear operator, we can move it out of the bra side and replace with a Hermitian conjugate. Then the requirement of the amplitude remaining unchanged is imposed. Since phi and psi are arbitrary states, this implies that u dagger u must be equal to the identity. This means that the operator u must be unitary. Let's look at the second type of solution, which preserves transition probabilities. We implement this transformation with the operator u bar. u bar preserves the probabilities in a different way. Instead of leaving the amplitude itself unchanged, an additional complex conjugation is effected. Since the probability is an absolute value of a complex amplitude, the complex conjugation of the amplitude will also leave the probability unchanged. This means that u bar is an anti unitary operator. The definition of anti-unitary is the condition in the yellow box. Here we note an important property of anti-unitary operators. They must also be anti-linear. Here's how an anti-linear operator acts on a superposition of states. It is basically a linear operation with an added complex conjugation on the coefficients of the superposition. Suppose we apply u bar to another state phi, which is itself a superposition of some other states.
Then the inner product of the two resulting states is given by the following. We can now apply the anti-unitary condition to the inner product between the component states in the yellow box. Using the superpositions that define the states psi and phi, we notice that the final result is just a complex conjugate of the original inner product which should be expected from the condition of anti-unitarity. This result relies critically on the fact that the anti-linear condition in which an extra complex conjugation is taken is applied to the complex coefficients. If we have assumed u bar to be linear, the result would have been inconsistent with anti-unitarity. Hence, an anti-unitary operator must necessarily be anti-linear. To gain more understanding of the anti-unitary operator, let's also look at its Hermitian conjugate. U bar dagger can be defined in the following way by its effect on an inner product. This is very similar to the unitary operator except for, once again, an additional complex conjugation. If we use the property of the anti-unitary operator on the left-hand side of this equation, the action of u bar on this inner product can be compensated by a complex conjugation. Substituting this back into the original equation, we get Comparing both sides of this equation in the yellow box, given that phi and psi are arbitrary states, we obtain the following result, which states that u bar dagger is the inverse of u bar. This is the same condition that is also satisfied by any unitary operator u. In fact, we have defined u bar dagger in this way just so that it would be the inverse of u bar and satisfy the relation below. This definition also fits the criteria of an operator Hermitian conjugate as it allows the shifting of u bar from the cat side to the bra side. The famous quantum physicist Eugene Wigner proved an important theorem in 1931 Regarding symmetries in quantum mechanics, it states that any operator which represents a symmetry must either be an unitary or an anti-unitary operator. These are the only two possibilities that preserve all transition probabilities. The proof is intricate, and we shall present it in a separate video. But based on what we have just discussed about these operators, it seems plausible. In these lectures, we are concerned almost exclusively with symmetries that are represented by unitary operators. Anti-unitary operators are only relevant when describing symmetries that involve the reversal in the direction of time. But more about this later. We now look at an important class of symmetries known as continuous symmetries. These are symmetries that could be represented by unitary operators and are connected to the identity by continuous variables. Examples are transformations like space-time translations and rotations, which can be specified by some continuous variables. These unitary operators are connected to the identity in the following way. When their dependent variable, epsilon, is set to zero, they become the identity. They are basically operator value continuous functions which satisfy this condition. This is necessary as the action of the identity is to do nothing. Taking translation as an example, this means a translation by zero amount, which is also a translation. Note that epsilon is a real number by convention. Like any smooth function, u can be expanded as a power series for finite epsilon. 
In this form, it is obvious that u is equal to the identity when epsilon is zero, satisfying the required condition. The term t at the first order in epsilon is an operator, which is defined as the generator of u. The imaginary i is included just by convention. t essentially defines the type of symmetry that is represented by u, and epsilon controls the magnitude of the transformation. Why this is so, we shall soon prove. The remaining terms in this series are higher orders in epsilon. We can neglect these when epsilon is infinitesimal. Let's consider this case presently. This is known as an infinitesimal transformation. In this form, we can isolate the operator t and examine its properties. Let's see how the unitary condition constrains t. We substitute the infinitesimal form of u into the left-hand side of this equation, and drop higher orders of epsilon, keeping only the linear term to be consistent with our infinitesimal condition. We discover that T must be a Hermitian operator. But what about the case of finite transformation? This operator could get quite complex in principle, as higher order terms can't be dropped. Fortunately, we could use the special property of symmetries, which states that symmetry transformations of the same type form a group. For example, if we perform two translations successively, we get another translation. In general, a group is a set of symmetry transformations such that when you take the composition of any two elements, the result is another element of the group. The mathematics that governs these objects is known as group theory. Let's apply this composition law to finite transformations. Based on this group property, we can build a finite transformation by repeated applications of similar infinitesimal transformations. Each of these individual transformations is infinitesimal, because their magnitude is given by epsilon over n, where n is large. At the same time, we apply these n times. Taking the limit, n goes to infinity. We obtain the finite transformation, e to the power of i epsilon t. In this last step, a well-known identity about the exponential function is used. This is a common result and could be found in most calculus textbooks. You can also look it up on Wikipedia. From this expression, we can see why t is called the generator of the transformation u epsilon. This is quite a remarkable result, as u is now related in a simple way to a Hermitian operator, instead of being some complex operator function. This is all due to the special property of the composition law of group elements. We can easily extend our results to symmetries that have multiple variables. For example, translations in 3D takes three variables to specify, one for each axis. In general, we replace epsilon by epsilon index by A, where A labels the different variables. Each variable is then assigned a different generator. Therefore, epsilon t is replaced by the following sum. This is apparent when we look at the power series expansion of u when extended from the single variable to the multivariable case. We can tidy up this expression by introducing the Einstein's convention in which we summed over every pair of repeated indices and leave out the summation symbol. 
Therefore, the corresponding finite transformation is given by For the multivariable case, let's prove that this operator is really unitary. Taking the Hermitian conjugation and using the fact that TAs are Hermitian, we have, which is the inverse of U epsilon, This implies that U is really unitary. Our proof is actually quite general and says that taking the exponential of I times any Hermitian operator always gives a unitary operator. Hence there is a close correspondence between unitary representations of symmetries and Hermitian operators. Since physical observables are also described by Hermitian operators, we can derive them from symmetries. This is in fact Weinberg's approach, as we shall see. Now, let's examine how the ordering of operators affects the identities satisfied by their functions. Take these two operator functions as an example. The inverse of e to the power of i epsilon t is just equal to e to the power of minus i epsilon t. This identity works as if the arguments of these functions are ordinary numbers. This is due to the fact that the operator i epsilon t commutes with itself just like ordinary numbers. In fact, this point is crucial for the identity to hold. This is clearly illustrated in the next example. Here we look at identities of functions which holds for ordinary numbers but not operators. Take a look at this equation which clearly holds when x and y are numbers. Suppose we substitute instead two operators which do not commute. Will this identity still hold? Expanding the left hand side while keeping the ordering of the operators. One can see that the equation does not hold precisely because the operators don't commute. So from here on, we shall freely use identities of functions of numbers on operator variables whenever all of them commute. Functions of non-commuting operators must be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. We will now prove several operator identities that will be very useful to our discussion on symmetry transformations. The first has to do with expressions of this form, in which an operator G is acted upon on its left and right by the exponential of some other operator c. We shall see that this is a standard form describing symmetry transformations in quantum mechanics. Our task is to evaluate the right-hand side of this equation as some series in terms of c and g. To do so, we first look at a slightly more general expression where we introduce the variable y as an expansion parameter. y is an ordinary number. This is a power series, and its coefficients are given by the usual formula. These coefficients are operators. In the end, y will be set to 1 to give an expansion of the expression above, which completes our task. Let's evaluate this derivative as a first step towards solving these coefficients. Using the product rule, we have where each derivative brings down a factor of c on either side of g with a sign difference. This can be written as a commutator. Therefore, it can be seen that each derivative on the left-hand side will add a factor of commutator with c. 
Because g is arbitrary, this pattern can be extended to any number of derivatives. For the case of n derivatives, this just corresponds to adding n nested commutators. This allows us to solve for the power series coefficients. Now that we have the coefficients g n, let's rewrite this a little. Recall that the definition of the commutator allows us to flip c from the right to the left by adding a minus sign. Flipping all n nested c to the left in this expression will give a factor of minus 1 to the power of n. We now introduce a new notation that will simplify our expression. We define what is called the adjoint action of C on G as their commutator. This allows us to write the n nested commutators in the yellow box as n powers of the adjoint action of C on G. And we end up with a compact expression for the coefficients G n. Let's substitute this back into the power series below. At this point, g can be pulled out of the series, and we recognize the expression in the yellow box to be the power series of the exponential function. If you can only remember one power series, this is it. Collecting all our results, we have. And finally, setting y equals to 1. We obtain this operator identity. I don't think there is a proper name for this. We shall call this identity 1. This will turn out to be very useful for symmetry transformations which as we shall see, takes the standard form on the left hand side. And if we know the commutation relations between C and G, the right hand side will allow us to evaluate this expression easily, as it is nothing more than a series of nested commutators. This equation highlights the importance of commutators in an explicit way. Let's apply this identity to an example which seems unlikely to work at first glance. Let C be dependent on some variable t, and G be a differential operator with respect to this variable. You may be doubtful as to whether identity 1 could be applied to such a case. Because ordinarily, if we assume the operator G behaves like a matrix, it will just act on the term immediately to its right. Whereas if G is a differential operator, it will act on all the terms on its right via the product rule. As it turns out, we don't have to worry about this complication because the rest of the terms from the product rule end up cancelling in the commutators. We shall see this presently. Let's evaluate a typical term that would appear in the series expansion of the right-hand side of identity 1. This consists of n nested commutators, with the innermost commutator between c and g as a derivative. Expanding this, we see that the last two terms are due to g acting from the left of c. There are two terms because the differential operator acts on all terms to its right, by the product rule. The last term exactly cancels with the first. And we are left with the negative of the derivative of c, which is denoted by c prime. So remarkably, the derivative ends with just one term, instead of continuing to the rest of the enclosing commutators, which will result in quite a mess. Therefore this turns out as we have said, the complications that would have resulted from the product rule of the t-derivatives cancel in the commutators. Thus identity 1 could be applied to g equals a derivative. 
What is left is n minus 1 commutators enclosing C prime. This is just the adjoint action of C raised to the n minus 1 power. Let's substitute this back into the power series of the exponential on the right hand side of equation 1 above. Notice that the sum on the right hand side of this equation starts from 1 instead of 0. If we look at the n equals 0 term on the left hand side, we will notice that it is equal to the derivative of 1, which gives 0. Therefore, this term could be skipped and the sum could start from 1. Let's look at the series in the yellow box. By shifting the summation index n, we could rewrite this as a new sum that starts from 0. C prime can be pulled out of the series as it is independent of n. The function in the yellow box is of this form, where we leave its argument as an empty bracket just to keep things tidy. Let's figure out the function that corresponds to this series. Shifting the summation index such that the sum starts from 1, we are able to pull out a factor in the denominator. Pay attention to the term in the yellow box and compare it with the series of an exponential function. We find that this is equal to the exponential minus 1. This is the function that is the result of our series. Let's call it phi. Substitute this back to the right hand side of identity 1. We arrived at identity 2, which is a special case of 1 when g is set to the derivative of t. In a minute, we shall use these two identities to prove one of the most important relations in the group theory of symmetries. But before that, let's explore the notion of the adjoint action a little further. We know that for each adjoint action of c on g, we get an additional commutator with C. So the powers of the adjoint action is equal to the number of nested commutators. What do we get when this power is zero? Since the zeroth power of anything is one, we substitute the adjoint C into the argument of one, which being a constant, just returns one. So the answer to our question above is just g. There are zero factor of commutator with c. This seems like a trivial result, but can be quite powerful when properly exploited. Let's look at this representation of the zeroth power of a joint action again. We can write 1 as 1 over f times f, where f is an arbitrary function. Making the arguments of the functions explicit, we have. This implies that the inverse of f of the adjoint action of c is just 1 over f adjoint c. This will work miracles for us in our proofs later. What makes this amazing is that f of a joint c is in general a very complex series of multiple nested commutators. But the inverse of such an operator turns out to be so simple. We know how to evaluate functions of a joint actions as long as these functions can be expanded as a power series. This is because positive powers of an adjoint action are well defined as nested commutators.
Now we shall use the two identities we have just worked out to derive one of the most important relations in group theory, the campbell baker hausdorff formula. The CBH formula provides an answer to the following question. Suppose we apply EA after EB to get a resulting EC, where A, B and C are operators. What is C in terms of A and B? Note that it is always possible to put the right-hand side of this equation into this form, since we can take the log of whatever it is on the right-hand side, then exponentiate it. Once again, it will prove useful to work with a slightly more general expression by introducing a variable t to go with b, thus the resulting operator c must also be dependent on t. At the end, we shall set t equals to 1 to get the desired result. Therefore, our job now is to solve c of t in terms of a, b, and t. As a first step, Let's set up a differential equation for C. The left-hand side of identity 2 provides a convenient form to get at the t derivative of C. Let's work this out by substituting in the expression for E of C from the top equation. We can now use identity 2 to relate the left-hand side of this equation to the derivative of c. We now have a first-order differential equation for c of t. This equation is not quite satisfactory because of the term on the left-hand side, which makes this a nonlinear equation in c. Therefore, we have to first express this in terms of a and b using the equation above. Taking the log of this, we have c. Note that this is not simply a plus b t as it would be for ordinary numbers, since a does not commute with b. Now we have to solve the equation in the green box with the help of the expression in the yellow box. More explicitly, we have to figure what is the adjoint action of C in terms of A and B. Then substitute this into the differential equation. Taking the adjoint action of C in the yellow box, we have. But what is this? In other words, how do we express this in terms of the adjoint actions of A and B? To answer this question, we will need the help of identity 1. This identity can be put into a more convenient form if we include an extra minus sign to C. Thus using identity 1, we have now we can use the equation in the yellow box at the top to replace both the exponential of c on the right hand side. Then we work our way out with the innermost operators first, applying identity 1 repeatedly, and we get... Here we have used the fact that an ordinary number like t can be pulled out of an adjoint representation because it commutes with everything and can be factored out of any commutator. Since g is arbitrary in identity 1, we can apply the identity again, treating the term in the bracket as the new g with a as the new c. And the result is a simple expression in terms of the adjoint action of A and B, precisely what we are after. As G is arbitrary, we now have a relation between the adjoint actions of A, B, and C. Taking the log of the expression in the yellow box, we have the answer to our question above.
Now that we have the adjoint action of C in terms of A and B, let's put this back into our differential equation. Here's where we use our magic formula to invert operator phi. Look at the expression in the red box. Here's the magic. It is simply equal to 1. And we know how to evaluate the right hand side of this equation as long as the function 1 over phi has a well defined power series. Thus we have inverted this equation just like that. This just goes to show that when we have the right formalism, equations will solve themselves. Imagine having to do this without the adjoint representation. We can now use the relation and the yellow box between the adjoint representations to substitute for the argument of phi. And we end up with a first order linear differential equation for C of t with a non homogeneous term on the right hand side. Before solving this, let's tidy up the function in the yellow box, which is of the form where we leave the argument of the function as empty brackets. Recall the definition of function phi. If we replace the argument of this function with the negative of a log, we get... Flipping this upside down, we can write the function above as this. This function is defined as psi. Let's substitute this back. Finally, we obtain the differential equation for C, which we are now ready to solve. This is done by just integrating both sides of this equation with respect to T for the interval 0 to 1. Note that the left hand side of this equation comes from the definition of C which can be written as the log of exponential functions of a and b. This is apparent just by comparing these two yellow boxes. Notice that on the left hand side, we can write log ea as just a. The reason we can integrate this operator equation just like an equation of ordinary variables is that an integral is basically a sum, and a sum is not affected by the non-commuting properties of operators. Let's rearrange this equation. Using the original definition of c in the green box, the log function on the left hand side is just c. After a great number of rather simple steps, we have finally derived the famous CBH formula. This tells us how the exponential of two operators can be combined to give an exponential of a third operator, and exactly how this is related to the previous two operators. Let's take a closer look at this term that consists of all the nested commutators. If we expand psi as a series in terms of the adjoint actions of a and b, a typical term will look like this, which is a nested commutator of the form sin in the green box. This is a commutator of either a or b with another commutator that possesses a similar overall structure. This is precisely the structure we expect from powers of adjoint actions in the power series of psi. What we don't get is more complicated structures like the one shown below. Let's work out an example. We shall evaluate C up to first order commutators. To do this, we first expand the function psi as a Taylor series. We shall expand psi 1 plus u 
as a power series centered at u equals zero. This is because psi contains a log function which is divergent at zero, therefore we choose to expand around one instead. All these will become clear once we go through the steps. The point is that we need a series that is well defined. Psi 1 plus u is equal to the following. Where the denominator just becomes u. The power series of log 1 plus u is given by. Dividing by u in the denominator, we get. Which gives the resulting power series. We only need to keep u up to first order since we are calculating up to only first order in commutators. This will be apparent in a few steps. Looking at the argument of psi in the expression for c, we see that u is equal to the exponentials of the adjoint actions minus 1. If we expand these exponentials to the leading order of the adjoint actions, the 1 is cancelled, and the series for u starts with the first order in adjoint a and b. These generate first order commutators, and we see why we only need to keep u to the first order. Therefore, the psi function found in C is given by this power series. The dots are higher orders in a joint A and B. Substituting this back into C, we get where the effects of the adjoint actions on B is given in the yellow box below. We see that the term containing a joint B in the green box can be dropped because the commutator of b with itself is equal to zero. Therefore, the integral of t just gives the following result. Putting this back into the CBH formula, we have... You may wonder, what good is this formula? If the higher orders commutators are missing, and there are no easy ways of calculating them. In situations where perturbative parameter lambda is included with both A and B, this will be a good approximation, as higher orders of lambda may be neglected if lambda is small. Let's look at another special case of broad interest where we actually have exact results. This is the case where the commutator of A and B is a C number. Because a C number commutes with any operator, all higher order nested commutators enclosing it must evaluate to zero. Therefore, all commutators of orders 2 and above can be dropped as seen in the yellow box above. And we get this neat result, which is exact. An important example of operators which commute to a C number is the commutator between position and momentum. For this case, the above version of the CBH formula is often used. We have reached the end of this video. This concludes Chapter 3, Part 3 of Weinberg's book on quantum mechanics. If you find this video helpful, consider giving it a like and subscribe to this channel so that you can follow along as we go through the whole book. See you next time and thanks for watching.